Google Analytics disappeared from the list of uh, trackers in my subscription. And you know, if you think about the old world, the way that things used to work, you imagine that some Google executive tracked down the person who's maintaining this list and you know, showed up with a briefcase full of cash and there was some shady backroom deal where hands were shaken and you know, uh, Google Analytics was removed from this list. <coughs> As far as I can tell, that's not what happened, and that actually something much more subtle and much more insidious actually happened. Uh, the way that Google Analytics works is um, through JavaScript. Uh, what happens is uh, website operators who wish to use Google Analytics just import a little bit of JavaScript into their HTML file. And uh, when the page loads, the JavaScript uh, tracks you. Now, uh, what Google did was they started including small bits of just usefully generic JavaScript functions into this Google Analytics JavaScript file. And what they were essentially saying was, hey, you guys are importing this JavaScript file anyway, just to use Google Analytics on your website. We're going to throw in a few just generically useful functions and we've done this right and you know, we figured this out that you can use as long as you're importing this thing. And uh, that way you can just use it for the, the core functionality of your website. And so now what happens is if you block the Google Analytics JavaScript, you don't just break Google Analytics, you actually break the core functionality of the website. Because now this JavaScript functions that the website is actually depending on for the functionality of the website don't exist. And so again, what they've done is they've expanded the scope of the choice that you have to make. It used to be a very simple small choice. Do I want to be tracked by Google or not? S simple enough, you can either block the JavaScript or not block the JavaScript. Now the choice becomes larger. Do I want to visit this website or not? And again, that's a much more difficult choice to make. So, you know, why is this significant, right? Um, well, okay, this guy's name is John Poindexter. Uh, and in, uh, he's an incidentally the guy who was found to be most responsible for the Iran Contra scandal. He was uh, convicted of lying to Congress but then never went to jail. Um, and in 2001, he started a, a program, a government program called Total Information Awareness. And uh, he, he made a speech uh, when he announced the program where he said that data must be made available in large scale repositories with enhanced semantic content for easy analysis. And essentially what he wanted to do was have the government siphon off all email traffic, all web traffic, all credit card history, everybody's medical records, uh, and throw it into one big sink. Just put it in one big pile. Don't worry about analyzing it or processing it, processing it in real time. Uh, and then develop the um, technology to really efficiently mine this data, uh, to pull out the interesting statistics, relationships, profiles uh, that uh, they were interested at any point in the future. So you just collect this big sink of data and then uh, at any point in the future you can go back and pull out anything that you want from it. Uh, so this was the totalitarian future. This was the, the cypherpunk nightmare that, you know, they had been worried about, right? This is what they had been thinking about and preparing for all this time. And people freaked out. I mean, you know, this was, um, the, you know, a significant story in the news. Uh, people were up in arms and in fact even Congress was like, what are you guys doing, you know? Uh, and eventually the program was shut down. Well, okay, so why was it shut down? You know, first of all, these people are clearly from the old world. They really don't know what they're doing. This was their actual logo. <laughs> this isn't like the onion made a logo <laughs> in parody of this. This was the logo they came up with. They have the pyramid with the eye of God and a light beam shining down on the planet. That little bit of Latin under there means knowledge is power. I mean, come on, you know. <laughs> I, I mean, if you're going to have some like scary government program, you know, you need like a friendly logo. <laughs> you know, don't, you know, don't call it total information awareness. Call it the kitten surveillance society or something, you know. <laughs> I mean, I mean, really, you want something that's sort of like, Colorful, you know, almost cartoonish, something that seems childish and, and, and really harmless, you know? Uh, something like this. Because <laughs> if you go back and you look at what Total Information Awareness was trying to do, Google has done all of it. Uh, I mean, uh, 
in, in fact, they have exceeded the original scope of what TIA dreamed to collect and process. Uh, and one thing that we know that they've really excelled at um, and, and actually how they've made their money is in being able to really efficiently uh, mine the data that they collect and pull out the statistics and relationships of everything that they have. Now, clearly their intent is different, right? Um, they are not joint John Poindexter, they're, uh, they're trying to sell advertising. Um, but make no mistake about it, they are in the surveillance business. That is how they make money. They surveil people and use that to profit. And so the effect is the same, right? Now there's this quote, who knows more about the citizens in their own country, Kim Jong-il or Google? <laughs> now I think it's Google, I think it's pretty clearly Google. Um, but so once again there's this question, why are people so concerned about uh, the surveillance practices of Kim Jong-il or the John Poindexters of the world and not as concerned about people like Google. Well again I think it comes back to this question of choice, right? You choose to use Google and you don't choose to be surveilled by John Poindexter or Kim Jong-il. Um, but once again I think the scope of this choice is expanding and that it's going to become harder and harder to make that choice uh, until once again it's a choice between participating in society or not. I mean already if, if you were to say well I don't want to participate in Google's data collection so I'm not going to email anybody that has a Gmail address. That's, that's probably pretty hard to do. I mean you would be in some sense removed from the social narrative. You would be cut out from uh, the part of the conversation that's happening that is essential to the way that society works today. Uh, so once again I think that this is going to become this on the scope of society itself. So I would think that I would say that trends have changed. Uh, that now we're dealing with a situation where technology alters the actual fabric of society. That information as a result accumulates in distinct places and that the eavesdroppers now just move to those distinct places. Uh, the past was really direct, right? We saw the eavesdroppers trying to embed uh, surveillance equipment into every consumer communications device. Uh, and the present is much more subtle, right? Instead of doing that, they just move to the few distinct places where information tends to accumulate. Places like room 641A in the AT&T WorldCom facility where the NSA has been operating a fiber optic splitter for who knows how long. Um, the past was direct. You saw people like Total Information Awareness directly trying to take your data. And the present is a lot more subtle. That it starts by soliciting rather than demanding your data and then the eavesdroppers just move to those points where the, the data collects. So when I'm thinking about the future, uh, the first thing that I want to think about is these choices that aren't really choices. And uh, I want to deal with those uh, as problems. I want to acknowledge that the choices are expanding and that in some sense they are becoming demands. So some projects along those lines. Um, some projects along those lines. Um, the, at first I started by thinking, okay, well, so what's up with Google, right? Um, the main problem is that they have a lot, an awful lot of data about you. Uh, they record everything. They never throw anything away. They have your TCP headers. You know, they have your IP address. Uh, they issue you a cookie. Uh, they know, they know who you are. They know where you live. They know who your friends are. They know about your health, your political leanings, your love life. Um, they know not just a lot about what you're doing but they have some significant insight into the things that you're thinking about. Uh, they've also done a really good job of uh, controlling this debate by defining the terms, right? They say things like, well, you know, we care about privacy so we anonymize your information after nine months. Well, what they mean by anonymize is drop the last octet of your IP address. That's not anonymity, right? But they've done a very good job of being able to define that as anonymity so that they can just start throwing that word around. Um, they also did this brilliant thing with this uh, Google dashboard where they say, oh, you know, we're, we're putting privacy under your control. And uh, first of all, they only show you some of the information that they are most obviously capable of collecting about you. They don't show you any of the other uh, correlational stuff that they could easily derive about you. And the most sort of diabolical thing about it is to, is that to get privacy you have to be tracked, right? Because to have a, uh, to control your privacy using uh, the Google dashboard, you have to stay logged in all the time and ma maintain a cookie. Uh, so it's like, you know, they've, they've turned the tables on you. Um, and, you know, they have warned us, right? You know, Eric Schmidt said this famous thing, if there's something you don't want anyone to know, maybe you shouldn't be doing it in the first place, right? So they've warned us. 
Uh, and you know, lastly, we now know that uh, Aurora, these Aurora attacks on Google, were at least partially about intercept. Uh, you know, one thing we learned from those attacks is that uh, the government is running intercept systems on their networks, um, and that not only that, but uh, other eavesdroppers were trying to gain access to those intercept systems. So what we're seeing is as data more and more data accumulates in these places, it becomes more and more valuable. And so eavesdroppers move to those places and then even eavesdroppers without illegal backing uh, also try to move to those places. And so I think we're going to uh, continue to see that as a problem as these become uh, more and more valuable over time. So one project that I uh, started working on is called Google Sharing. And uh, the basic premise of Google Sharing is that this choice that we are given is a false choice and that uh, we shouldn't accept it, we should just reject it. And so what, what we should say is, you know, it's not really possible for us to stop uh, participating uh, with Google and so instead what we want to do is come up with technical solutions that allow us to continue to participate and uh, still maintain uh, our privacy. And so the way it works is uh, it's a two part system, it's a Firefox add-on as well as a custom proxy server. And uh, the add-on sits in your web browser and it watches uh, your web requests. And uh, all of your, you know, non-Google traffic just goes directly to the internet, totally unmolested, uh, not modified or, or, uh, or in impacted at all. <coughs> then if it sees a, a request to a Google service that does not require a login, these are things like Google search, uh, Google news, Google maps, Google groups, Google images, Google Shopping, but not things like um, Google Mail or Google Checkout, then uh, it, it um, sh uh, shunts off that traffic to the Google Sharing Proxy uh, server. The Google Sharing Proxy server uh, maintains a, a collection of identities and each identity is uh, a unique um, HTTP header set. Uh, these are, you know, sort of like the fingerprint of your web browser uh, as well as a, a cookie that was issued by Google. And so these are maintained in this pool and every time a request comes in, uh, one of these identities is randomly chosen from the pool and uh, the identifying information from the request is stripped off and the stuff from the identity is tacked on. And then it's forwarded on to Google who uh, processes the request, responds to the proxy and uh, the information is proxied back to you. So, uh, you know, the upshot is that uh, Google, um, can't track you, right? Because these cookies are constantly moving around and uh, your traffic uh, does not come from your IP address. Additionally, we uh, encrypt this first link uh, uh, using SSL between your web browser and the proxy. So that means that actually you even get uh, SSL protection for services that Google does not provide SSL access to. You know, Google now has uh, SSL protected search, but none of the other stuff like maps or shopping or groups or images are SSL protected. But you get that with Google sharing. And how does it look? Uh, it looks exactly like um, it, it's indistinguishable from using Google directly. Um, you can use all of their services, Google Maps, Google News, whatever you like, totally transparently. The only difference is that in the bottom right hand corner there's a little uh, status telling you that Google sharing is enabled. Um, Additionally, Google has sort of given us a, uh, a win here by um, uh, allowing us to make SSL um, protected searches. Uh, and so now what we can do is have the client uh, prefetch cookies from the Google Sharing Proxy server uh, and then make an SSL connection end-to-end uh, -end directly uh, to Google. Uh, and so now the Google Sharing Proxy server is proxying the data and uh, sharing cookies around and uh, identifying information around but uh, cannot actually see the requests uh, because they're SSL protected all the way to Google. So now uh, you don't have to trust us not to um, examine your uh, requests. So anyway, this project is available online. It's been active for about six months now. We have about 80,000 users and you can get the add-on from googlesharing.net. Another project that I think is interesting um, is this thing called Face Cloak. It was developed by Professor Urs Hengartner from the University of Waterloo. And uh, the idea or his basic premise is that um, using Facebook, uh, what you're trying to do is share information with your friends uh, or friends of friends. Uh, but you're not actually trying to share information with Facebook. You know, there's no reason to give them the information. And so he developed this interesting sort of proof of concept Firefox add-on that sits in your uh, web browser and uh, anytime you type anything into Facebook you can prefix it with uh, two at symbols and when you do that it will just transparently encrypt it before uh, 
uh, sending it up to Facebook. And then he has these mechanisms that allow you to really easily uh, share keys with uh, your friends. Uh, that way, uh, if they're also running the add-on, then it will transparently decrypt it uh, before displaying it. So the, the net result is that everything works uh, just totally the 